Hi, everybody. This is David P. France, and I'm coming to you from Basel, Switzerland. Before we get started, I want everybody out there who's watching uh, to like our video, subscribe to our BitChute or YouTube channel, and also share, your, share the videos, um, like and subscribe to the channels, of course. Uh, we are David P. France TV, uh, and we are a platform for creators and creative people. Uh, artists, inventors, um, thought leaders, small business owners, and entrepreneurs. And today, um, I'm very happy to have on again, uh, Jamil Lawrence. And he is, but where are you, Jamil, today? Are you you're in London? Or are you where? You could be anywhere. In the UK. I'm back for round two, coming to you from Glasgow uh, okay. in Scotland, which is okay. my kind of base. Uh, okay, kind of. We'll go into that later. Well, <laughs> Jamil is a producer, choreographer, filmmaker, entrepreneur uh, in the dance world, and um, also the founder of the Fun Freelance Dance. I'm going to throw that in, and we can talk about that later. But um, Jamil, how how are things? How are you? How what have you been up to since the last time we spoke? For a very lengthy, lengthy interview, the last time. Well, what's been going on with you? Yeah, I mean, we don't want this one to be too lengthy. No, but no, no. We're gonna try is that. That, well, the truth is a lot has happened. Um, I finished my career at Scottish Ballet on the 25th of June, and my feet haven't touched the ground since. Um, not by my own design, I should add as well, but um, things have been rolling. Um, I went as a filmmaker to Ballet Island for a month, um, this then turned into a dance job as I had to step in for an injured dancer. Um, and then I became an injured dancer right at the end of that process. So that was a new thing for me as a dancer that wasn't traditionally injured very often. Um, I have some more recent announcements as well. Um, a film I made since we last spoke uh, won the John Byrne Award, uh, the quarterly award. So that was quite a prestigious thing for me to be able to say, Here's a stamp of approval from the arts community in Scotland, where I'm quite known. Um, I then went down to London, where I'm less known, and announced that I'll be uh, executive producing a show. Um, I say executive producing. I, I don't know how to say it, really. I'm just, I'm putting a show on. Um, so that we're going to come back to, Ballet Nights. Right. Uh, I received a commission announced last week from the BBC, so that's a technology commission for uh, BBC Arts and One Dance UK who have teamed up for the hashtag Dance Passion 2022. Uh, and I'm going to be working with BBC Connected Studio using their MakerBox technology, Audio Orchestrator, which is a very simple but also complicated technology involving using sound in uh, new and exciting ways uh, and your mobile device being heavily involved. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's very different to, uh, you know, the other stuff I've done. So it's not a film as such. It's more of a, uh, it's almost like an app that you would pick up and do as a family, at your school, as professional dancers, as casual dancers, and even at the company level as the uh, samples I'm going to create will show. And mm. um, what else? Uh, the Lantern Studio Theatre, where I'm the assistant to the director, project manager, has been growing. Uh, we've come back from the pandemic wanting to uh, really increase our performance program. So there's obviously my show, Ballet Nights is there, um, Ocean All Over, who's another company from Scotland actually, is gonna be making the journey to London for a show uh, also in October. Um, so that's all happening. Uh, and some ex obviously we've also been hosting the hires of those musical theater productions that are coming back for the first time. And a lot of them all at once needing to rehearse, prepare and get back on stage as quick as possible as the West End opens up in London. Um, and the final thing I've been doing um, the final two things, uh, fun freelance dancers continued, which we'll discuss. Um, and I've expanded my, uh, my creative work into Wales for the first time. So I've been working in Cardiff with Rubicon dance mm -hmm. and there's lots of exciting announcements coming and there's lots I can talk about already with them. Okay. Well, we're going to go back <laughs> and break this down, but I have a quick question about the travel that's required to go through, or go, uh, between all of these places. I've been on the train from London to uh, Scotland, and then I haven't been to uh, to Wales. But I, and I know that you you mentioned to me before we started that you were in Spain and then also Ireland or whatever. So, what is a normal day or week 
I mean, and also, it doesn't take a long time. To, I mean, do you take the train or do you take the plane? Well, so the the answer is I don't know. To you know, what is it like? I don't know what the average week would be like, but I was in like so. Take the last couple of weeks uh, or three weeks rather. I've been in Glasgow where I'm planning a new film um, called The Art of Class, which is the brainchild of Karen McIver, who's a musician, pianist, uh, artist up here in Glasgow, who I've known as a long time because she plays for, uh, known for a long time as she plays for class at Scottish Ballet, where I obviously grew up. So it's someone I've known for 12 years and making this film for when I'm sitting with her in Glasgow. I'm then getting the flight down to London, which is, you know, probably 20 minutes to the airport. I tend to get there an hour before, no luggage, hour and a half flight, and then an hour to where I stay in London. Um, from London, I've been going to Southampton or I've been going to Cardiff. Those are both two and a half hour journeys on the train-ish. Uh, Cardiff back to London, London back to Glasgow, Glasgow straight to Cardiff. This has been going on nonstop for about three weeks. Uh, in the middle of that, uh, I'd planned a one week uh, sort of holiday meets personal training session. Um, where a very good friend of mine, James Espinosa Shoot, who's a uh, personal trainer, he took me for a week and put me through my paces and gave me a program that would help me now I'm not dancing uh, as often. <laughs> However, uh, coming back from injury and recently um, a to be announced uh, full length production that I may have been chosen <laughs> to create, I'm going to need to be in some shape. So uh, I'll be also in the midst of all this traveling now starting to take class again, uh, yoga, fitness, all of it. No. So I don't know the answer to what the average week is, but there's a lot of traveling and something that's new from taking on so many projects is travel time is uh, work time. Sure. I always came up with my best ideas on the plane. In fact, one of the very first pieces I made that had a sort of highly technical um, narrative to it, which was about numbers I came up with on a flight um, in a flurry of excitement, which was again, Glasgow to London, but cut mm. to now, years, years later. Um, I've got a stack of 16 emails to get out during a flight. Um, I've got lots of posters, uh, social media posts to prepare. Um, because obviously with all of this, at the moment, I'm launching so many new things and I'm on my own. Um, mm. And that's why for ballet nights, for the first time, I've got a co-producer. Um, and I'm telling you now, the next time we do it, we're going to need a social media officer. Um, because it's it's all of these things require it so much. Really, well, the social yeah. media part is, it's a lot of work. Okay. So Jamil, tell us uh, about ballet nights. Tell us about um, the idea, how you came to the idea, where you are in the process of putting the project together, et cetera. Okay. So uh, Ballet Nights as a concept um, presents evenings of classical ballet, neoclassical and contemporary dance in new, exciting and unique ways. Um, and what it will do is it will place uh, main stage choreographers uh, into our event alongside uh, emerging choreographers, legacy acts and experimental works up close and without compromise. And the reason I say that is that it's hosted by the Lantern Studio Theatre, which is uh, my venue that I obviously manage. Um, and, you know, our venue is unlike a theatre, but it's also unlike an art gallery, but it's also unlike a studio. It really draws elements from each and creates this unique space, but also it's only about three, it's 300 audience members. And um, so we have this opportunity to do something that hasn't really been done uh, in dance, especially in ballet before, which is taking um, the models that I'm inspired by, such as with the comedy store in LA. Um, we have this opportunity to kind of do that in dance um, with a compared evening with me speaking before each act and explaining what you're going to see, why it's in the show, why it's important to be seen um, and what it means basically. So it, it, it's it's sort of a Jules Holland of, uh, of dance in a way is, is how I'm kind of pitching it. And yeah, it's very exciting. I mean, the way it came about was <laughs> I was on a trip in Scotland with a very good friend of mine, Henry Dowden, um, who is the co-producer now on Ballet Nights. And uh, 
we were on a trip with some other friends of ours and um, also a very important influence on me, Johnny Austin. Uh, John Austin is a, a sponsor of a lot of my work and supporter. And he's, but his business knowledge is there all times to sort of be used and tapped and, and, and questioned and tested. Yeah, so we'd been having these conversations all weekend and at 2 a.m. Um, with a, a couple of whiskeys because we're in Scotland, me and Henry are sitting there sort of, two dreamers kind of saying what is it we want to do what are we trying to achieve and I listened really carefully to what Henry told me as a kind of young entrepreneur um, in waiting someone that already knows you know where they want to go and knows that they have something and is waiting for that start yeah. um, and I'm also sitting there myself thinking right well Henry's got this strength and this strength and these assets and I don't have those but I have got this knowledge and this network and these assets and th this is a pairing that could do something and um, so cut to a week later and I'm heading down I think I was heading down to Southampton to then go to Cardiff to Rubicon dance and I'm sitting in Waterloo station and this idea just just entered me and um, say the same as with fun freelance dance from our last yeah. podcast you know I believe in ideas being living things that kind of enter you and you can you can be a vessel a channel for them and I sat there and ballet nights just began to form in my head. I was like, well, what if I ask these choreographers that traditionally might have been out of reach, but through the pandemic have realized how important it is to have their work seen, to share the joy of their creation. And um, obviously not regardless of ticket price, but you know, not as the first thought. Um, and I was in the original cast of David Dawson, Swan Lake, um, as was my fiance when it was first done in 2016 up here in Scotland with Scottish Ballet. Um, it was a very important ballet for Constance because it, it's the ballet that made her principal. Um, and for me, it was a very important ballet because it taught me a new kind of physical geometry that's now not left me since. And I, I really think that David's work changed me profoundly. Um, and it set me up as well for when I was to then go and dance Crystal Pite, who also sort of affected me as profoundly. So I emailed David and I said, you know, David, what would it take to maybe get a short one minute solo, maybe white swan solo or black, black swan solo. And he replied, and I remember how excited in sort of panicked way I was when I read this. Well, why don't you want to do the whole uh, part of dirt? <laughs> so I was asking, so my, obviously, I was asking let myself. Me ask you, let me ask you though. I mean, you only, you asked about the solo because you thought he would only grant you well the date so david dawson for those that don't know is probably one of the the first names in modern living classical neoclassical ballet choreographer um he is resident choreography choreographer um it feels like everywhere in europe he's in dutch national ballets he's with berlin he's in germany in in in, in uh, dresden he's, he's everywhere and you know his time in the uk was with us in scottish ballet and a bit with the royal ballet and then he's back in europe again and his work isn't accessible in the uk for a start so to ask an artist to say can i can i you know um use this work mm. also for scottish ballet for, with whom i'm hugely grateful for permission and um, this was the going into pandemic uh production that was going for its second run so since 2016 this was going to be the second go and sort of the re the remount so there'd been changes David had been over and it was heartbreaking for Constance and a lot of the dancers that this wasn't going to be performed and when you dance David David's work you change your whole physical regime everything and, and, mm. and you know me living with Constance who's my fiance to be uh, I, I'm with this sort of Amazonian athlete <laughs> okay. and, and then there's a pandemic and she can't perform and 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 I remember feeling like I need to do something. How do I, what do we do? How do we take this energy? And, and so that's why I asked David of how much it would mean to Constance and how much it would mean to me. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got the reply I wasn't expecting, which is how, why don't you do the duet? And David has given me a work that, you know, um, is inaccessible probably for most financially also to, as, a, as a producer to buy yeah. and just place in. And he said, here's a gift. I give this to you. Um, I give this to you. I believe in what you're doing. Um, I want Constance to feel, you know, she, there is no other person doing it. It's Constance, you know. Um, and I, I didn't really know what to say because this elevated everything. Suddenly I had one of the world's best choreographers in the first iteration of this new event that I was producing, an event that's never been done before and presented in new ways. And, and the David was very clear 
he said to me, you know, there are conditions here. This needs to be presented at the highest standard, at which, yeah, that's right. thankfully, Lantern Studio Theatre is able to do. I was able yeah. to say, I was able to say, yes, suddenly all these assets that individually mean different things, suddenly they come together as one. Um, and then the programme grew. Um, we have, you know, we're going to have a, a, a Grand Par from Don Q. We're going to have Jeffrey Sirio as an example, as a, you know, fairly established choreographer, but hasn't been seen in the UK so much. Um, we've got legacy works. We've got um, Robert Cohan's Communion Solo, which was one of his last works before he passed away, um, with an Olivier-nominated artist and friend, Luke Armet, from Front Freelance Dance, who you've interviewed and met, mm -hmm. um, performing that solo. Um, and lots more new creations as well. Um, I talked about putting new creations alongside established main stage acts. And that's very important because that speaks to the 21st century aspect of this program. You know, we're not presenting audiences with um, a historic thing. We're presenting them with what's happening now. Um, everyone on stage is what's happening now. Yeah. Um, and we have a pianist. Uh, Victor Eric Emmanuel will perform solo Chopin and he'll also perform the Chopin with uh collaboratively with jeffrey sirio so the collaborations begun there um erase tapes which is one of my contacts and assets i use for filmmaking they're going to work with daniel davidson on a new work so that's another joining and and, and so how, it many, is just how many how many how many the ballet nights will there be i mean how many how many events will be <laughs> you, you need to sort of like um how do you say it uh, come up with like is it going to be like once every three months every week you, you nailed it it's you nailed it it's it's the aim is to become quarterly that's the the aim uh -huh. the ultimate aim um you know ballet nights also works with a company called the lockdown room they they supply all the drinks and hospitality and oh, dan and Valentine. Right. Yeah. Well, Dan and Valentina, they're a new bar. Again, it's new, it's young, um, and they're, they're wanting to do things. We're experimenting. You know, we've got, we've got a bar at Lanterns, but we've got a lot of space, so we can have a gin pop-up. We can have people... Um, we, we've got a, a wonderful selection of craft beer for any enthusiasts out there that are in London at the time. And, and 23rd of October, in case I didn't already say. Um, and, uh, yeah, ballynights.com. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, the concession is really important. I mean... I told you, like, I'm interested in dance, but I'm, you know, I, I'm also interested in all of the other aspects from the point, like, how they come into the space, how they feel when they enter the room, or the, the theater, what happens, like, from the point where the music begins or the lighting begins. So when I go to a show, I'm one of those people that is looking at all of these different elements, and I think... Um, it's one of the reasons why we've talked about this before. It's one of the reasons why I I was hesitant to get into dance in the way that you have, because I wanted to go straight to this entrepreneurial uh, mm. aspect of events, you know, and and of course, um, you know, dance was one of the types of events I wanted to produce, right? So. That, that happened, I, I think, years ago um, when I was in college. So even when you're talking about it now, it sort of is, is bringing up a lot of um, uh, past feelings about <laughs> it's got to be this. It's got to be that. <laughs> what <laughs> can you tell us? Um, is there anything specific about ballet nights that you want to impart on the audience that is going to be sort of like the one line or two line um byline would you call it or or or, or sort of yeah pitch. i mean yeah you kind of nailed it with that audience experience when you walk in so mm -hmm. you know the elevator pitch is it's new mm -hmm. it hasn't happened before and there's an opportunity there to be there at the beginning the way ballet nights is presented it draws from my inspiration in this area which would be the comedy store in la um, and look what that's done for the, the, the stand-up right. scene. You know, Dave Chappelle still comes and does a set to 60 people, despite the fact he's Dave Chappelle. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're doing the same thing, just with a massive stage. So we have a 17 metre by 17 metre sprung stage mm -hmm. and a big grand piano. And this so when London, we, right? this is at the Lanterns, yeah. And so when, we, when I say um, up close and without compromise, uh, the front row is literally it's back to the stage so when mm -hmm. they start to come forward they're pretty much you, uh, 
short of dancing it yourself i don't know how much closer you could get um and there's no bad viewing angles so we we present dancing widescreen so you're very close and there's you know a tiered system of four or five tiers only and you're they're, they're layered so you're not you know you're not looking you're not looking through people right and um, so yeah it's it's when i say it's new and it hasn't happened before i'm not saying dance hasn't happened before i'm yeah. not saying choreography hasn't happened before i'm not saying bespoke drinks hasn't happened before and i'm certainly not saying that compared var variety evenings haven't happened before but in this way i don't think there's been a combination like it in a long time and i think coming the coming together of so many artists under the age of 40 in the performance circle and you know mostly in the creation circle as well alongside those artists that are happening right now as well um i think that it's it's a real buzz of fresh energy and i think that other dance companies will start to notice and i think they'll identify that this isn't a threat because we're not taking you know we're not taking <laughs> tickets yeah. away from opera houses what we're actually doing is we're creating the best kind of advertising you can get preview your work at ballet nights share an excerpt from a main stage work at ballet nights all those emerging choreographers for those directors that are there every day saying i want to make a piece yeah. give them the opportunity to perform at ballet nights and um, what makes you let me real quick what makes you think that people are thinking that it's a threat though i mean it doesn't to me, it does not appear to be, it would not eat into anyone's profit in that way. You understand what I mean? It's, it's a sampler. It's a, it's a, it's a, that's how I envision it, right? Uh, it, you it is are a literally sampler. pulling people from different. Uh, yes, but, but those people are seen, don't forget, as assets for those companies at a time when in a pandemic, there's a lot of sensitivity around what can get on stage what will sell tickets and you know if there was ever a time that all the dancers in the company have to pull together it's now so i'm super grateful to all the companies that have given permission for the you know rombe mm -hmm. english national ballet scottish ballet like I'm, I'm very grateful i'm also grateful to those independent artists that you know they understand what ballet nights can do for instance kennedy knows what this can do for his company to preview his work there um but at the same time, that creates work. It, they've got to get their dancers together. And Ballet Nights isn't starting on the highest wages. You know, these galas that you sure. read about dancers earning £5,000 for a da, da da That's not really where we're starting. But it's where we would like to get. We would love to be the first name in variety dance acts, in previewing, like I said, excerpts of new works. Um, mm -hmm. And we want to build a following. The people that go to the comedy store, many of them have grown up with the comedy store and it's their go-to venue on Saturday night. So we would love to build an audience that maybe hasn't experienced dance before. This is how they begin. And that sends them on to the Opera House, to the Coliseum, maybe up to Scotland, maybe even further afield, go see David's work in, in uh, the Netherlands or in... Um, Germany if it really touches you in that way and um, I, I think that the reason I talk about there being a threat is that there's a lot of caution right now as there would be in any business um, but yeah as I said we haven't yet met any real resistance and um, and I've done you know because I'm me because I've come from a company and because my director was very open with me about what are the challenges facing companies national companies big sure. companies you know, I'm able to identify where the friction might be. And therefore I've been able to navigate a lot of that. And, and I'm not cheeky. <laughs> I don't, I don't take the mickey. Like I really do abide by all of those requests that have been asked. And because I know that if we build that good relationship in the future, we're going to be able to continue to present these acts quarterly. Yeah, it's quarterly. Do you have a production um, team already in place or uh, how, where are you at? terms of that's that, that no so no <laughs> no i mean i'm the executive producer right. i made the fatal mistake of putting my own money in which you should never do as a producer well, but you know I, yeah i believe in the project that much mm -hmm. and henry who's my co-producer is using every spare minute while still being a full-time company member of english national ballet um mm -hmm. he's 
very strong in the areas of networking and connecting with East London. And East London is where this is happening. It's not happening in the West End. And oh, well, in London, yeah. you probably know this, there's a feeling of, oh, it's so out of the way, Docklands. It really isn't. It's uh -huh. 15 minutes on the Jubilee line and you're there. We're on Canary Wharf's doorstep. And I think that leads us on to a very important aspect of this, which is where it is. And East London's Docklands is going through a big transformation. The Canary Wharf cosmopolitan area of London that was formerly business central has become primarily residential. There's a lot of development that finally has got people moving in and living and young affluent people all over walking about. You can see them. It doesn't look like the Docklands I grew up in as a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you get is, is you've got all these places to live and nothing to do. There's right. not much to do. And that's why because the bankers and lawyers that, you know, only I think it's 40 percent to 60 percent of the workforce is returning to in situ working in the banks, in the towers. And um, we've got car parks being turned into go kart tracks. We've got um, Canary Wharf is going to become a residential um, accommodation, which, yeah. you know, 10, 20 years ago, that would have been nuts. 30 years ago, it was the only building in the area. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, these big business hubs, they're transforming. Um, the big development groups like Galliard Homes and Ballymore, um, they're creating more and more uh, outdoor spaces, indoor spaces. And they're, they're yet to understand, I feel, truly, the um, strength in developing a cultural art scene in the area. Mm -hmm. um, but an interesting supporter is the hotels. And the Hilton, who you wouldn't expect as a big major brand to be open to this, I did a David Dawson to them and I went to the top first and they said, yep, yeah, we're going to set you up with a discount deal for your patrons. We're going to set you up with accommodation for the acts that are traveling from further away. Um, it's really been a lesson in ask the question and you'll get the answer. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's fantastic. I mean, um, since our last interview, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot that has uh, transpired. I mean, it's a whole other dimension. I mean, it's a whole, other, a whole other level. And you know, another thing I'm pleased about is that the idea, your idea and my idea for this channel is, is somewhat similar because I'm literally, you know, pulling people almost like a variety of different people to showcase them and give them a platform is, of course, this is not a, you know, TV show or a, um, how do you say, a ballet show or a theater show. Um, it's like one at a time, but what I was just telling you, and I'll share this with the audiences as well, um, as a result of all of these different interviews all being on one, one space or one page, um, the channel that we've now reached a point where we've um, clocked in about 10,000 views for all of the videos on the channel. So that's a landmark that we've reached. Congratulations. Yeah, it's 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 important because I mean, all this I had no idea that it would. Um, I, it wasn't even on my mind, and I will. And I also shared with you just before um, we started that um, I had another person, another choreographer, uh, I interviewed uh, Henning Rubson from New York, and um, three days later, that's when we hit the mark. Right. So there is a hunger for different types of people being presented. There's a hunger for talent being presented in different ways. And that's maybe one of the reasons why I said, well, I don't think you're gonna be eating, you know, anyone's cheese, right? I think that <laughs> there's room, you know, for what you're doing because you're literally building a new, almost a, a platform that's an extension, not an extension, how about it? It's almost like a, let's say the ballet companies are here, you know, on this level, you're, you're it's almost like you're, you're like a, a ramp. You're building a ramp in a way, you know? What I yeah. Mean? And also it, it's a ramp to an evening out. It's mm -hmm. not, we're not building a ramp just to see dance. We're trying to build an evening, you know, the hotel deal, the fact we've got the bar attached. We've also working on a deal with a local restaurant. Yeah, we're trying to build an evening event and and you know this would be you know the same way that stand-up comedians go to the comedy store to see their right. friends perform we want to be at a level where it's not a chore for a director because you know directors get asked to go and see so much stuff and please come and see my work and please commission me and please you know this is not that the work's already been made that you're going to see sure, or if it sure. isn't it's new work that you're getting to sample alongside your favorites we're 
aiming to entertain. We're not we, we're not shackled by the the. This is an important point as well. We aren't government funded. We aren't even private funded for this one. For this one at the moment, as it stands, we're trying to do this by ourselves. We are looking for sponsors and supporters, but we're not looking for those that would then take control of how the right. how the operation right. runs. And right. there's no board of directors. There's no, you know, it's me and Henry. Um, and of course, the director of the Lantern Studio Theatre, my mother, um, <laughs> Janet Viola, she obviously has a big say in how the venue looks. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not, trying to fix every problem and it's not aimed at fixing every problem and it isn't trying to fill the gap that national dance companies or bigger no, dance companies no, it's a whole um, other thing. It's yeah a whole it's other not thing. it doesn't need an education department it doesn't no, need any it's another department. thing it's a commercial it is a commercial venture right it just is involving dance it's, it's involving dance and dance pieces or dance programming and it's it's actually the natural answer to fund freelance dance, my other initiative, where we do take donations and it's about fundraising and all that money goes to the artists. You know, I'm trying to build the rails here. It's It can't be, and I've been very vocal about this, as you've probably seen across several social media platforms. At the moment, you've got dancers in training going into student debt. And now even with a fourth year, which is, you know, an apprenticeship in a company, which uh -huh. is student loan backed. And of course, struggling companies are going to say yes to this. I'm not saying that anyone's at fault here, but at the end of the day, you've got all these dancers. There's a platform for all these education journeys. Where's the commercial opportunity? Where's the jobs? We need job creators. No, you're this building is, them. <laughs> it's the best time. And, and Fun Freelance yeah. Dance gives that stepping stone of yeah. we keep you in shape and we try and provide you with the tools that you can keep yourself dancing and then we provide the platform where you dance. And Luke's this a great is, example is, of that. This is what I think. And then we're going to ask you about your other things. And I don't want to keep you so, so long like we did the last time. But you, you're coming around the theme with this um, at the right time. Because one of my arguments and one of many arguments I have with re regard to the dance community is that the same things are being presented, you know, year after year, decade after decade. <laughs> And in the case of ballet, I guess centuries after centuries, I don't know. It's, it's, there has to be somewhat, and I, I'll link it to hip hop and rap. There has to be a point where dance and the dance community come together, and whoever these new people are or the old people, they have to configure in such a way where you really are churning fantastic work right now. I don't know what that the the the, the uh, initiative or how people are going to come together but it's the only way because like, when you when you compare sort of like the way the rap is is done or has been done it comes from the neighborhoods right and then there's you know people that rise in their neighborhoods and then they somehow you know go out there and and sort of um mix it up a bit and sort of emerge it's like oh these guys the top rapper Right. And then as a result, they get an audience. Yeah. But it, let's say a long time ago, there were so many acts coming out. This is like in the late early 80s. Mm -hmm. I mean, one rap group after the next, after the next, after the next. And there was a, a an apparatus or a infrastructure that allowed these artists to get out to the public. Right. So yeah. that the public could see them. And what you're doing is you're, you know, and we're going to talk about your technical BBC project, but you're literally trying to use all of the modern apparatus or the, the, the uh, technology to make sure that people know who these people are, right? If, the new yeah, ones it, and the established ones. Right? But it's the kind of, I think this is the right word. It's cathartic in a way. Yeah. Like I held a lot of anxiety and frustration and anger that, when I was choreographing and I'm very impatient. So like I hadn't mm. been struggling for long, you know, but in my struggle, I felt like the opportunities weren't being given to me. Why was I not eligible? Why would I not get this thing? And, and you know, the way the human brain works, like it must be personal. It must be me. Mm. There's something wrong with me. And I started to realize that all the decisions now being on the spreadsheet side of things, it's market and market sentiment. And we casually discussed before about the fact that, if you're going to do something that everyone else is doing in a market that's saturated, 
you're not launching anything you're not right. doing anything new and i say this to fun freelance dance artists that ask for advice around what they should be doing if you go you've got two options you either go somewhere and do the thing that's happening but do it different which is where ballet night sits right which is it's performing on stage but done completely differently and with a very different audience experience to the local area companies you know the nearby yeah. ones and different price point and different everything or you go somewhere new and you do something new and you take what you've been trying to get done here and you do it somewhere that doesn't have it because if they haven't got it then there's a need and you create that need and these yeah. are basic market principles and um, working in wales wales has a very complicated um history with dance it's in a you know post pandemic it's not in the best place um but there are some organizations that are doing things differently and they're doing them new and i've gone and i found one of those organizations which is rubicon dance and you know through my track record they've said right we trust you to take us on the new journey which they're yet to announce um but may involve a full length work um and you know i've been trying to get a full length work for the whole journey this has been what it's been working towards and the last place i would have thought had you asked me in 2015 that my first full-length work would be would be in wales specifically where i'm doing it in wales where that opportunity didn't even exist pre-pandemic um so it, it, it's like it's like you said you, if it if there's too much of it and it already exists you're just you're not creating the market conditions in which you can succeed you know you're banging i have, I, I, I think i think the dance world has the potential if the right finance people are behind the right choreographer the sky's the limit the issue is how to get these people in the same room or find the people that are the up-and-coming producers entrepreneurs that want to take the risk investors and that is a different configuration than what it was pre-pandemic or and then also current right so there are new waves of people that have money that have this love for dance right but yeah. they're not being just like you know in terms of people who are venture capitalists who want to find new projects there are dance people or investors who love dance that want this kind of opportunity and it's really about trying to bring these people and the talent together so that's one of the reasons in, that i created the channel right so that artists could then present what is the scenario what is the condition right what what is the idea and yeah. then we talk about the idea and make sure that we get it out let me let me jump to the bbc project that you're talking about there are two other things you talked about the dance uh project in wales and we can go on to the the bbc uh technical project is that correct how, how so, that? That? so yeah no so bbc dance passion uh 2022 oh. this is the second iteration of uh, bbc dance passion and I was in the original 2019. I, I provided one of the Scottish offerings, which was my work flight, which was down the stairs um, at the BBC base over at Pacific mm -hmm. Key. Uh, this year, it's in collaboration with BBC Arts and BBC, uh, sorry, BBC Arts and One Dance UK. And the commission that I received, um, there were five short film commissions. And then there were some technical uh, technology projects, sorry, not technical, technology projects. Right. And uh, that's working with uh, BBC Connected Studio using MakerBox technologies, of which there's a few. There's um, Storyformer and some others. And the one that I'm using is uh, Audio Orchestrator. So these are a lot of big words to remember. So please forgive me if I slip up on my words there, but everything's got a title and a really long name, um, but it's very exciting. And that will be to create a, uh, partic a particip participatory dance game experience, digital okay. dance game. Okay, okay. So that's how it involves technology. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I think, well, look, you've, you've, you've mentioned so much. I mean, I think the thing is what I hope at some point I will be able to um, visit you in the UK because I think just, I, I'll, I'll tell you this, there are people that are going to watch the video. They have no idea of the geography of the UK, right? In America, we're used to London. That's all we're London. used to was London, London, London. So we are like, oh, I went to Wales and then I went to Scotland and then I did this and this. I know the distance, right? And how long it yeah. takes, whatever, in order to get- It's, to it's not too far, yeah. Not too far, but the, the culture between the 
the places is very different and, and it's its own yeah. thing, right? And that's something that we don't necessarily make a distinction, you know, uh, as Americans or, or I, I can't speak for other nationalities. But, but you, you notice it so much when you do it within the same week. So, you know, um, I leave Scotland and I'm like, mate, see you later. And then I get on the train and I come off at the other end. You're right, mate, where are we going in the taxi? And then you yes. get in the thing and you go to Wales. Like, I can't do the Welsh one yet, but they do the Welsh voice. And then, you know, on your way back, you get stuck halfway. And then a load of Northerners get on with another accent. And when you think about the size of America and how far apart the states are, you get that same difference just city to city. It's 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 really interesting. Yeah, it's 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 a... It's something that I would like to tackle in the future, somehow being able to present the different ethnic regions of um, the UK, because I think if you don't have an idea, in the United States, and this is real quick, and then we're going to let you go. In the United States, when we talk about racial differences or ethnic differences, the American ethnography, if, I, if that's the right word, <laughs> I like is it. very it specific about around the idea of black and white. We talked about this before, right? Mm -hmm. In the UK, that doesn't really work. That, you know, there are black people in the UK, of course, but the history is different. And there are other groups, other competing groups that vie for the title of, you know, oh, we're the victim or, oh, we're the, you know, oppressed or, oh, we're the, there are a lot of different groups different than what's in the United States, right? So a lot of times we make an error in terms of geography. A lot of times yeah. we make an error in terms of um, uh, racial or cultural differences, yeah? And um, I think what's great about the UK is that when you visit, and if you guys visit anytime soon, you will immediately see these differences just traveling between the different cities from London, yeah. To, to any of the cities in uh, Scotland versus uh, Wales, which I haven't been to yet. But I'm even saying East London versus West, the Western part of London, right? Or South London or North as well, right? So it's, it's an incredible. Experience. There may be a new work that you can come and see around December time in, in Cardiff. So there you go. There's an excuse. Yeah, we'll see. And then there's an excuse. We'll figure something out so we can get more, you know, right now, like you say, it's just me, right? Like, you know, for you, it's like you and your, your producing partner. It's just me doing these videos. But I can tell you for sure what we're doing here and, and giving you a platform and giving other artists a platform. I know we're going to grow, right? So yeah. I don't know where the money, uh, the resources, um, where would they will come from. But I sense, just based on this interview that I've completed with you, that there's so much possibility. So, you know, I want to thank you. I think I think that you know. the opportunities as well is important to say anyone listening, like find the opportunities. That's what's changed all of it for me is, is seeking the opportunity. They're not, I've never been someone to wait for it to come to me, but I may have had to look a lot further than I initially imagined for those opportunities. And no, look, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing for sure. All right. And I thought like this, as an 18 year old, I just didn't have anybody to interface with, right? And I was like, you know what? I, I don't know, if, I already knew that I wasn't gonna pursue a dance career because there was an aspect to it that I experienced even as you know much younger that I was like, mm, I don't know, I don't know, right? That doesn't mean that it's not, you know, I now look back and think, Dave, you could have at least, you know, you could have at least gone for it, right? But I was so, I had been so, um, I wouldn't say brainwashed, but I was so determined to, to, to have this, you know, I went to business school and law school, right, eventually. That was ultimately to be able to sit here and talk to you about what we're talking about now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is like you said, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for this platform, David. And I'm going to just shamelessly plug ballet nights one more time. <laughs> Unique evenings of classical ballet, neoclassical and contemporary dance oh, at the Lantern right. Studio Theatre London, 23rd of October, ballenights.com for tickets. Uh -huh. Okay, very it. good. And I also want to meet your mom. Like, I think your mom, she's definitely a key person in the story of Jamil Lawrence and uh, in terms of how you are... Uh, operating um it would be really interesting to meet her because she's also 
the person that is is behind the theater, right? I mean, she's yeah, that's my mum. My mum built a theater out of nothing. It was a council building with um, office networking pylons and stuff in the middle, and the council kind of said to her, you know, if you don't use this space, we're going to have to start to uh, you know look at putting someone up there janet and and you know my mother janet she said i i don't want other people walking in my entrance <laughs> of my other businesses so i've got to do something and then i remember i was away i think i was in the czech republic young on a on a summer course or something and she phoned me up she said, i've built a theater in the roof <laughs> and uh, i remember coming back and going oh my god all this roofing torn down uh -huh. the, the networking torn out this old aircon system torn out and and, you know, I became the project manager of the Lantern Studio Theatre in 2011 um, after that process had happened. And through my dance career, although I didn't get to go to any kind of business school or college, you know, that was my business school. And right. today it services all the biggest production companies in the UK for hires, for rehearsals, for new creations, dance as well. Um, and it's really the time for the venue to build its own performance programme and, uh you know, being now out of the full-time dance career, I have, I've got the time and space to do it. Um, Janet's very keen as well because she's wanted to kickstart this. But, you know, when everyone's open and everything's great, it's very difficult to join in a conversation that's already happening. But um, now with the pandemic and all this residential community surrounding the Lantern Studio Theatre, all these towers and nothing to do for anyone, right. there's probably never been a better time to make use of what is the most unknown and underrated venue uh, in that area. So anyone listening that wants to produce a show at the Lantern Studio Theatre... <laughs> Well, well, lanternstudiotheatre.co.uk I, I am curious I'm going to go look this up I mean um, I know I, I, I'm really interested and also the geography right because I also look at street maps to see what's going on so I'm going to be doing a little research I'll come back to you go for it and uh, well, thank you I'm going to close it's about 9 o'clock now here in uh, Switzerland um, thank you very much Emil for your time and um, thank you, you know, so much we'll talk soon okay yes I wonder what it will be at the next check-in. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I mean, I just I feel like I'll have, built, I'll have I built something. Yeah, right. I, I saw the, you know, the ballet nights and it was a big, you know, poster of, uh, on the, um, of designed, well-designed on LinkedIn. And I thought, okay, he's doing something. I need to uh, <laughs> reach out to him again and see what, what he's been up to. So anyway, thank you. Have a great evening and we'll talk soon. Thanks, okay. David. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye.